the economic rules that doom us and who's calling the shots on Assange. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 29th of July 2022. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party leader and founder Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. On today's show, we're going to be talking about the rules based order in our politicians' heads, and we're going to report on the Converge on Canberra rally for Assange, which uh, Robbie Barwick was at. Now, if you like the show, don't forget to hit the like button subscribe and ring the notification bell and share this as widely as you can. Also, if you can leave a comment, get the debate going, uh, it helps circulate the video more widely and get other people onto these ideas. So, on to our first topic, the economic rules that doom us. So, um, we've had a few discussions back and forth uh, that we'll report on over the course of recent days about the state of the Australian economy, the state of our finances and what our politicians, the new uh, lot of them that are in control at the moment in Canberra are going to do about it. So we want to talk about some of the axioms in their head uh, that are not only limiting an economic recovery but actually sabotaging it in yeah. effect. Um, so just by way of background, the IMF, as people would have seen in the news this week, has updated the forecast that they made during their April World Economic Outlook and they're saying literally that the world is teetering on the edge of a global recession. Uh, of course, we're seeing uh, more countries, the US Fed raising interest rates by three quarters of a percent. We've got the European clouds of crisis gathering and getting worse, of course, not only on the financial front, but the economic front, um, energy crisis and so forth. Um, we'll have more to say that about that in future. But um, what we're seeing in particular is that all of the reactions of governments in most cases are making the problems and the crisis much, much worse. Um, so I want to just cite from um, this last week, some of our politicians and what they've had to say, and particularly with the focus on what Jim Chalmers, uh, the Treasurer, has had to say. But first of all, Prime Minister uh, Anthony Albanese told The Australian on the 20th of July, uh, referring to the upcoming budget later in the year, he said that there won't be any new revenue raising measures in the October budget. It will be focused on finding savings. And of course, there's been a, a lot, um, a drumbeat building where they're indicating cut, we're going to cut, 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 um, because again, as I said, they've got these rules in their head that they're following. So what Jim Chalmers had to say on Thursday, he gave this um, speech in Parliament, which was basically a preview uh, of what's coming with the budget in October and also uh, updating what they've said so far since they've come into government. Now, ahead of that speech, he said that gov he will look to trim spending at every opportunity he also said very explicitly that government expenditures, quote, are costing more and more to service because every dollar, every additional dollar in the budget is a borrowed dollar and that now costs us more to pay back because of rising interest rates. Now, remember that because we're going to have a bit of fun with that later and take on those axioms. During his actual speech, um, there was a lot of talk about facing up to hard realities and making tough decisions, um, but he also claimed that there's a broad acceptance, he said, of hard things we have to do now that will pay off in the future, uh, supposedly. Um, he stated that the debt burden is at the highest level as a share of the economy since the aftermath of World War II and that that debt burden is growing heavier because of the impact of higher interest rates on repayments. Um, certainly true in and of, of itself, but listen to this statement, which is critical. Um, and this is because of the fact that, you know, the debt we're borrowing is from overseas. He said, interest payments on government debt is the fastest growing area of government spending, faster than spending on hospitals, on the NDS, on aged care. Now you think about that, the fastest growing area of our spending is on interest payments on debt. That is crazy, but that the solution to that is not don't get any debt, 
it's you have to look at getting the debt in a different way through a credit system. So we'll come to that in a moment. But he, he concluded with this rhetoric saying that we need a future where we make think more things for ourselves, create wealth for ourselves and control our own destiny. But the only specifics he had on that were cutting childcare costs, um, going with renewable energies, which are somehow going to make energy cheaper, ask Europe about that one, um, and you know solving the skills crisis. So, you know, yes, we want to make things ourselves. Yes, we want to create wealth for ourselves. But as we'll talk about shortly, there's only one way to create wealth, and that is with actual investment into the real economy through a credit system. But finally, before we get to that, Stephen Jones, Financial Service Minister, also had some comments which reveal these axioms of their thinking. He told the AFR on Tuesday 26 July, and this was about the discussion of the blowout of costs of the business registry consolidation that the past government has done. Uh, he said, we're going to have to look and find new sources of savings or new sources of revenue. We've got a set of budget rules. Every new dollar spent has got to be offset with one dollar saved somewhere. So unless an exception can be made for this, we have got a set of budget rules that we're going to comply with. Um, and now he's made a couple of comments too. Um, one was in regard to the expiry of the fuel excise exemption in which, to which he said, you know, because people want to know, is he going to extend it? Um, because it's about to expire. And he said, no serious government would change that. And this is the same comment he made when he was confronted by investors, well, not investors, but people who um, bought their home through the Sterling First Trust, which turned out to be an investment that they were swindled into, uh, to which when they were asking for compensation, he replied that no serious government would compensate them. Because again, there's rules of the system you can't, um, flout and um, yeah. what's there's nothing more important than the financial system and the rules of that system. Well that's thanks for laying that out Lisa because what we're talking about is what we hear a lot of and a lot of people get confused about this rules based order. Now we discovered this week there's actually a new name for this rules based order which was very unpopular when it first was raised because it actually spoke to the truth of the matter. It was actually called the Liberal International Rules uh, Order. order. Mm, originally. That's what it was originally called. Mm. Now, what was this? this? This International Liberal or the Liberal International Order, what was it based around? It was based around the dictates of the IMF, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. That's who dictated the rules. Now, what are these institutions? Pro-free trade. Right, they say they're pro-sovereignty, but not if it means going against the banking financial oligarchy, in particularly centred in the City of London. This means free trade. This means you know smashing the idea of tariffs. You know, going with the idea of what was called comparative advantage, which means the countries like Australia aren't supposed to have a manufacturing industry because we can dig stuff out of the ground. Mm. There's a whole uh, set of rules based upon free trade. And how somehow we have to swallow those rules as if they're the rules-based order. Mm. And I wish Jim Chalmers good luck in all of this thinking because it is crap and it's going to go down the toilet just like every other decision has been made in the last 40 years because it is still, it's not dealing with the reality of what we face us with, with right now. Look, we've got a banker's dictatorship that is dictating financial policy and none of what Chalmers is talking about at all has di is dealing with the cause of the problem which is the financial system dictated by this banker's dictatorship and consequently facing up to the hard realities, making tough decisions. Mm. What for the banks? They've completely ignored the Royal Commission. They're shutting down branches. Westpac just announced they're going to shut down another hundred branches which means you know, elderly people and people that need those services, oh stuff you. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll just throw you onto Australia Post and, and you know, you can use the Bank at Post facility there. Overload them. Overload the local post offices with banking services that, that aren't properly funded. Mm. Right. And then you talk about interest to payments on government debt is growing the fast area of government spending. Well, we do need to spend money on hospitals. We do need to spend money on aged care. We do need these sorts of services. And what we found during the pandemic is that we're woefully underfunded. And consequently, you know, when we came to 
when we came to dealing with the pandemic, we didn't have the depth of manufacturing necessary to be able to sustain ourselves. So this rules-based order yeah. is killing us. Yeah, the free market, as you said earlier, it dictates we don't manufacture because it's not cost efficient and so forth. It doesn't accord with all those rules of how you're meant to do things with efficiency and so forth. Um, and I, find, and I find, sorry, I find it a bit rich. The IMF comes out and says, oh, we're te teetering on the uh, edge of global recession. Well, you bastards are the one that caused this. Uh, absolutely. This is, this is the problem at the core of it. And there are solutions, mm. the historical solutions, which we know to go through some in this program, that can deal with this, but not thinking inside mm. the box. Yeah. So if Chalmers wants to build things here, make things here, he's got to throw out those comparative advantage and free trade rules and we have to actually well, look at our nation in and of itself, what do we need for our people to survive if we can't get it from somewhere else tomorrow. And, and is Albanese and Chalmers going to have the guts to, to actually look outside the box, to look at yeah. what actually China has done in terms of directing national sovereign credit into real infrastructure mm. development? Yeah. And, and uh, Elisa, the, the point is that this is, this is going to be their dilemma. This isn't going to work. What they're proposing isn't going to work. Mm. It hasn't worked for the last 40 years. It's not going to... Yeah, but they're trying all the same things we've tried already. Pulling the same leaders times. and they won't work. So let's talk about some of the rules and how we can think about it differently. So firstly, the rule number one, and of course we can't go through all the rules today. I've just chosen three. But number one, we have to borrow from overseas for new credit. So... Well, un <laughs> well let me just say under the existing system... Sorry, I'm And then I'll let you go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but our Australian banks borrow a third of their funding from offshore markets and the majority of it is for non-productive causes such as the bulk of foreign borrowings of the banks, of course over 60% go into the housing bubble. State and federal governments finance their budget shortfalls that they don't get from taxes and um, rates and things like that, well not rates, that's councils, but the other incomes that state and federal governments have, when they have a shortfall, they sell bonds, but they can sell them locally and they do, but over 50% of them are purchased by people overseas. So again, it's foreign investment coming in that we're depending upon and the interest rates and the repayments go back overseas. Um, so, and the other factor is that spending in Australia is not channeled into the productive workforce. So. Um, it is worsening inflation rather than when you're actually increasing the productive work output of our labour force, that is going to increase the supply of goods and services and it tends to counteract any inflationary impulse. And I wanted to point to something LNP Senator Jared Rennick actually said um, a month or two ago. Uh, he said, Every time an Australian entity borrows foreign dollars, they are transferring wealth offshore. This is a result of government outsourcing its currency control to a group of unelected and unaccountable foreign bankers. Um, so, yeah, when Chalmers talks about the fastest growing expense of the government being payments on interest, it's just all this money flowing out overseas. So we want to talk about the alternative to that. Is it true that we can only get new credit from overseas. That seems to be the way they think. Well, uh, in their bubble, yes, it is true, but it's actually not true if you look outside the bubble and say, OK, well, how do we solve this problem? People that must can realise that the government can actually borrow from the Reserve Bank. Mm. The Reserve Bank has the power to emit credit. It has never lost that power. But it's hands-off when it comes to this issue, except for the pandemic when they can create billions of um, billions of dollars as to, in an emergency situation, well, why not do that for the economy right now and spend, create the necessary credit and spend that into the physical economy, create things with it, build infrastructure, put people into work and use it that way. Mm. Oh, it'll create inflation. Well, we've already got inflation because the money that's being created and spent today is going into non-productive mm. sectors. It's gone into the housing bubble. It's gone into not producing manufacturers and so forth. That's interesting, you know, it's because China doesn't uh, uh, suffer from this level of inflation because, no. all, and they've created many more billions of dollars than we have. It's gone into the productive economy, high-speed rails, you know, building water projects, putting people to work. And this is the big difference between just creating money for the sake of money to prop up the banks and the financial system as opposed to creating the credit or money for the purposes of funding real economic development where you have a long-term asset at the end of the day. Mm. 
And you know, there's a long there's a long history of this in in our history. I mean, if you go back into the 1930s, you go and look at uh, Ted Theodore. He was a treasurer in the Scullin government for, for some time. There, he proposed the issuance of 18 billion million 18 million pound fiduciary note issue, which means the the money was. Um, uh, created without the backing of gold. In other mm -hmm. words, it was it was it was a power the Commonwealth Bank had, and it was a common thing. You know, he was talking about eighteen million pound. The Bank of England created three hundred and twenty million pound, <laughs> right? So, and this is there's so many double standards here, mm. in, when it comes to finance, that Australian people don't know. Now, what does that mean in real terms today? Well, eighteen million pound that he was going to create wasn't just to fund and prop up the banks; it was to spend to to actually hire. 50,000 public servants to build to, to build public infrastructure, right? So it was going to be put into the physical economy by employing people in the height of depression. Mm. And because we had a deflationary price, uh, cycle at that point where everything was sinking in price because people couldn't afford to buy things, he said, well, let's make sure we can get people back into work, put this credit into circulation. Now, we're not talking a huge amount of money compared to the overall budget back then. That compares to in today's terms, and people can do what is what's called a historical calculator. When you look back in 1931, you say how much was 18 million pound in 1931 compared to today's terms? Mm. Well, according to the Reserve Bank of Australia's historical calculator, that would turn out to be 1.8 billion dollars in today's terms. Mm. So, 18 million pound back in mm. 1931 is 1.8 uh, billion today. Now. The defence budget is forty six point forty eight point six billion dollars. Mm, it's nothing. So it's it, it's a very small amount. So when you're talking about you know putting money into the economy, we could go even more than one point eight billion, and we should in order to be able to fund real large infrastructure projects. But this is the point. Ted Theodore at that point was thinking outside the box. He also called for things like uh, Jack Lang at that point. Let's hope a moratorium or at least tax the the, the government debt which was overseas. The British bondholders had a lot of the, the, uh, the debt at that time. Jack Lang wanted to say, let's freeze all payments on interest because our people are suffering. Why mm. should we pay the debt to the British banks when the, the, you know, uh, Britain has forgiven the, um, the, had their debt forgiven by France and, and the United States at the same time? Why should we pay the debt back to, to, to England bondholders whilst we've got, uh, British bondholders, whilst we've got all these problems happening? Mm -hmm. now, uh, Ted Theodore said, no, let's add an extra tax on, let's create some more revenue so we can spend that back into the economy. So these two guys were very unpopular with the, the financial oligarchy of their <laughs> time because they were saying the problem exists in the finances. Let's redirect credit, let's create the credit necessary and put it into the economy to support to support the people. Yeah. So, I mean, this, these are the sorts of... Now, is Jim Chalmers or Albanese going to say, OK, guys, let's use a reserve bank to fund real infrastructure. Let's build the high-speed rail that Albanese is really uh, interested in building. Let's get these projects mm. off the ground. Are they going to have the internal fortitude to stand up against the financial oligarchy, this banker's dictatorship, and say we're not going to tolerate this mm. more? If, we, if they don't, the Australian people are going to be screwed much worse than we're in, our, we're in right now. I mean, you know, inflation's already going to 7, 8, 9%, right? You're going to see interest rates going up, mm. the same thing. And this, this means that, you know, the system's out of control mm -hmm. under the existing financial and monetary system that we have now. And the, um, as I said, the Reserve Bank still, and we've confirmed that the Reserve Bank still has the powers yes. that the Commonwealth Bank used to deploy. They and haven't. Did do. They don't use yeah. them, obviously, because under this current framework, free market framework, it would never happen. However, if the government decides to do it, and we talked about this on last week's show extensively, um, the Reserve Bank will have to follow those orders because the government has the final call. The legacy of Chifley and those others, like you mentioned, Theodore and others, is still there in the legislation. Although with this review of the Reserve Bank, we don't know if they're going to try and write that out. Um, but we're working with senators in the parliament that are very much determined to make this the top issue so that we can begin to build this country again. And just, Lisa, just a historical, to be clear, on the, on the historical uh, perspective for this, look, when we came into World War II, our economy was flat. It was coming out of the Depression. It was a decision made by the Curtin Chifley government to make sure that we had the credit necessary in order to be able to ramp up the manufacturing of munitions. 
So what we did was the government issued bonds that were bought by the Commonwealth Bank which gave the government the money in order to be able to fund the war. Mm. Now, it was a lot of money. It was a huge amount of money that the, the, the government issued in the form of, not, not money, but bonds that created the finances necessary to fund the war. But it was directed into the physical economy that Australia benefited, for, mm. benefited from for decades after the war. So there was something real physical, physical left. The Reserve Bank has the same capability. The government can issue bonds at very low interest rates, mm -hmm. The Reserve Bank can then issue the credits as through its systems in order to be able mm. to, um, to to fund the, 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 uh, yeah. the government's work. And I was just going to say, um, Whitlam's treasurer, Jim Cairns, told us, told Robbie Barwick in interviews he did uh, when he was still alive, that that's exactly what the Whitlam government should have done. However, because of what had happened to Chifley and others back in the 40s, who were clobbered by the money power, um, they weren't willing to go there. And so, you know, what eventuated, eventuated, and the government fell and so forth. This is a very unique power that governments have to create credit. And unfortunately, most people think about finance and money as like they would around the kitchen table. Mm. There's so much yeah. coming in, therefore you can only spend so much. And if you haven't got enough, you've got to cut it. Yeah, well, well the, yeah. I was just going to say, Jim Chalmers actually said that in as many words during his speech on Thursday. He said that households have to make tough decisions and it shouldn't be any different for government. Crap. I'm sorry, it's crap. And the historical Absolutely. precedents are there, mm. right? The governments can create extra credit because it's not for the benefit of the government, it's benefit for the yeah, general welfare. Yeah, it's not personal. Households don't have a... Cons Households might give money to charity and so forth out of what they've got. Right, because they've got a limited pool. Mm. A government has an unlimited pool, but unfortunately, Lisa, that responsibility has been completely ceded to the private banking system. And that's why you see this incredible wealth of the private banking system is because they've got this power. Mm. It's unlimited to the amount of credit they can create, and they do. And our Senate candidate uh, for, for New South Wales, Kingsley Liu, who was a, formerly a banker, I suppose he still is a banker, but also a solicitor, mm. he said it would surprise you how much credit banks can actually create. There mm. is no limit. Mm. Yeah. And that's... that's, that's uh, but uh, is it in private hands or public hands where it's for the benefit well, of people? Well, that's the problem. And that's why hands. governments exist. So what Charm is saying is, is absolute bunkum. But this brings me to rule number two, we have to balance the budget. And we'll put up this map because this relates what, to what you were just saying about the post-war period. Because if you look at the, uh, the red line up the top, the bars going downwards, um, this is the federal government deficit. So, of course, they were huge during World War II. But then you can see in this period, um, it's a, there's a little text there that says debt burden reduced in 1950s to 60s via GDP growth despite deficits. Well, in fact, because they were running these deficits, they were funding what you said, the reconstruction of the country. Um, the debt began to reduce, as you see in the pink section. So despite, despite having, at that time when we were running those deficits, the highest national debt in our history, the productive growth of that post-war economy enabled the government to pay down the debt without crushing austerity uh, and while running, while still running budget deficits. Mm. And this is a map by uh, Melbourne University economist Warwick Smith, by the way, which is very, very useful. Um, now, the third rule, because I think we've probably talked oh, about boy. that enough, but and I said we're only tackling three of them here today. Uh, <laughs> But the third rule is that austerity and economic rationalism is required to meet financial commitments yeah. when you're indebted and weighed under by, by debt and not enough money. Pensions to have to be cut. Healthcare has to be cut. All government services have to be cut. That's like Sir Otto Niemeyer from the Bank of England yep. in 1930. Mm -hmm. you know, it was wheeled out by the Conservatives, the, the Lions, and the pre, you know, it was a precursor to the Menzies government. You know, these guys... Their only idea is, again, cut, 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 cut in well, order to be able to balance the budget instead of expanding the economy because this is the way exactly, the bankers think. Exactly. You know, austerity is the solution when you don't have a solution because you're just saying, well, there's, we've got less to go round and we're not going to change that or improve that, so therefore we have to we can't take the cut power. you back here and cut you back there and slash this and slash the we other. We can't allow governments to become actually sovereign 
in the issuance of credit because that would inspire the population that mm. we can actually, we don't need private banking system. Yep. Which is why Chifley you know, came to the point in, nine, in the late 1940s, after he was treasurer and, you know, and actually as prime minister, came to the conclusion that he needed to nationalise the entire private banking system because yeah. they weren't acting in the interests of the general welfare of Australia as a whole. Mm -hmm. And he tried to nationalise the banking system at that point. And that's when they got clobbered <laughs> he by, got the clobbered by the banks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, austerity has never worked. I mean, people watching this show would be familiar with the fact that we did plenty of that after the global financial crisis. But... As you said, um, mentioning uh, Otto Niemeyer, who was with the Bank of England, who came out here to tell Australia what to do in this post-war period or earlier. Um, and we were um, trying to invest in building the country and they said, no, 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 you've got to rein it in, tighten the belt. That's the only way to do it because um, austerity was basically the invention of the British Treasury and they tried it. Um, after World War I extensively, and the Austrian school was a part of this. They slashed jobs of 100,000 public servants there. I mean, they cut back all the train workers, employees of all kinds, and it didn't work. Uh, in fact, it was the basis for loans they got from the League of Nations, which came in and fueled guess what? Speculation, because they were cutting everything, all the spending to the real economy. Mm. So this then led into World War II and the Great Depression. Um, so it didn't work then. It didn't work after the Great Depression neither. Um, and the example you gave um, was that there was the push for austerity here in Australia and Jack Land said, no, we're not going to prioritise paying bondholders who want their cut, their pound of flesh. We're not going to pay them and we're going to put money towards the public works we need. We can't, well, he said, you know, the unemployed would be left to starve if we paid the bondholders. But on the other hand, you had Prime Minister Robert Menzies, who insisted the foreign financiers, by the rules, must get their interest payments because there's nothing more important than the rules under that British framework. Uh, and he literally said if Australia were going to get through her troubles by abating or abandoning traditional British standards of honesty, justice and fair play or resolute endeavour, it would be far better for Australia that every citizen within her boundaries should die of starvation during the next six months. That's the same attitude today. Whether the Labor Party likes it or not, that's what they're embracing with this, potent, this, this directionality that they're taking. Mm. They've got a break from it. They've got the history to do that. But as Jim Cairn said, that uh, because uh, you know, Chifley lost the fight to nationalise the banks, that's when the soul of the Labor Party was ripped out. And it wasn't until Whitlam came in at 20, about 23 years mm -hmm. later that he tried to deal with the same thing. You know, by, by avoiding the British system of finance, by mm -hmm. you know, the whole loans affair, so-called, the attempt to finance Australia through other means, other than the existing financial British back financial City of London system uh, ended up him getting sacked mm, yep. because you know you can't think outside the box. So this is going to take a very brave government to deal with this problem, mm -hmm. but it's going to require also people to stand up and say, look, there is another solution. Yeah. Why don't you listen to the Citizens Party? Why don't you listen to history? You don't have to listen to the Citizens Party. All we're doing is recounting and reliving what great th people before us were able to think. You yep. know, Theodore, you know, Lang, Chifley. Um, Curtin, Whitlam, all mm. these guys had a different approach and thought outside the box. Now, they, they, look, they weren't all in agreement with one another. There was tons and tons of fights that were in amongst different people, mm. but they were thinking outside the box. And, yeah. you know, the fact that uh, Jack Lang said, no, let's not pay the interest on the bonds too. Not that we're not going to pay the bonds. We're not going to pay the interest on the bonds. The mm. fact that Theodore said, no, let's put a special tax on the interest on those bonds. Mm. We went defaulting on the bonds we were faulting on the interest on the bonds in order to support the Australian economy. And, of course, by doing that, you would have increased the Australian economy and made those uh, and the productive nature of the Australian economy and you could have paid those bonds back at a later date. Mm, exactly. Now, we've got a pathway to make this easier for Labor. <laughs> uh, and I'll, So I just want to quickly talk about the press release we put out on Wednesday, how a public postal bank would work in Australia because... This is somewhat of a stepping stone without going full hog to say we're nationalising the banks tomorrow because, mm. as you said, Labor has that memory there, um, that we can begin to move on that pathway with something that even New Zealand, which is sometimes 
called More British Than the British has done with Kiwi Bank and it hasn't been hasn't completely lived up to all the expectations but that's an ongoing fight but it has played a very important role to give people an alternative and access to cash and local banking and so forth. Um, so we're working very closely with different people um, within post offices, within local councils. We've been getting, uh, having a lot of dialogue and getting a lot of feedback of how this can actually work because we have legislation that we have ready to be tabled, but we need to have um, all the, um, you know, the down and dirty details of how this is going to happen so it's ready to go and to be implemented. So there's a number of things in that media release which you can look at for the details, but um, structure of the bank regarding the structure, uh, the new, there would be a new Commonwealth Government company which would be separate from the Australia Post Corporation and would have its own board and its own management and that would be legislated, that company, to operate through Australia Post in partnership with them to use their branch network. So that Commonwealth Government company would get a banking licence. The retail services for that bank would operate in exactly the same way as Bank at Post operates now because we've had some feedback from post offices saying, well, if we're a bank, don't we have to do banking and I have to employ a banker or become a banker. Well, no, it would operate in the same way as they provide the services now for the Commonwealth, Westpac and NAB. They would take deposits, they would dispense cash, they would provide the loan applications as the first step towards the loan and instruct people on what to do. Um, but the post office staff would not function as bank managers. They would not function as bank um, um, staff those banking functions would be done by experienced bank staff at regional offices of this new Commonwealth banking company. Um, but what we would ensure is that it's not just some big head office in Sydney or Melbourne, but that each region has a branch office of the bank with uh, experienced staff with intimate knowledge of that region. So local people, um, just like you know, um, people you know, always say once upon a time, long time ago now, probably not in some people's memories, the local bank manager was one of the most respected people in town. And the mayor and the, the local church leader. Mm, yeah, exactly. That, that's, so That's sort of gone by the way, wayside now, at least mm. with the more centralisation of everything. Yeah. So we talked about it more, uh, I think it was the week before last on the show, and you can go for more details about that, but look at the press release. But what we want people to do is to talk to their members of parliament and their senators about the proposal for the post office bank, there's a lot of MPs that have gotten elected at the last election in particular uh, who need to be schooled up on this and we're, we've got Robert Barwick in Canberra at the moment and we're already getting a very good response from people we've been able to catch up with, uh, including new politicians. So the more they hear from you, the more they are likely to listen when it's raised, uh, when another MP asks them to second the upcoming motion or to support it in some way. I think it's, look, what strikes me about this, Lisa, it's a very simple proposal. There's nothing complicated about this at all. Establish the new Commonwealth, you know, public post office bank as a an ent separate legal entity under law, right, use the existing Australia Post network, but the law would also guarantee that there is a cooperation at the technical level between the Australia Post offices and the banks, so that they're always supported. This is not a function of the local licensed LPOs that take, take initiatives on their own, without the support of the, the bank, the new the, mm. the new post office bank. And the fact is that this will give, through the footprint of Australia Post, a secure access point. When I say secure, it means it's there in their town. They don't have to travel, you know, to multiple towns or to, in, to, in order to do their banking services, and it's going to be government guaranteed. Mm. Which means whatever people put their money or deposits into this bank, it's going to be government guaranteed. Government guaranteed, not this, you know, two hundred and fifty million, a thousand dollar guarantee that the government's got now, which is never designed to mm. work. This is guaranteed by the government their savings. Their savings are guaranteed by the government. Mm. So the point is that those savings can also be put to work yeah. like it was done originally in the Commonwealth Bank. So yeah. there's a lot, and it's not its not a complicated concept. Therefore, it mm. will work and, and has worked and is working all around the world. So there's plenty of live models for this 
yeah. uh, that we're, you know, what yeah, we're the, proposing. The money stays far from fleeing overseas or to the cities. It stays local and it can be, as I said, it's a stepping stone to the full national credit approach where the surplus deposits at these banks can be invested into a national development bank and recycled and yep. invested in that way. Um, so there's lots of pluses and not many minuses on this one. Um, so get onto that um, with details below to find your contact details for your local MP and your senators. But we'll move on now to who's calling the shots on Assange. Um, so as I mentioned, Robbie's at this, um, well, yesterday he was at the Converge on Canberra rally for Assange. There were a few hundred people there. Um, we'll put up some footage in the background, um, which he took. There were speakers at this rally, including the host, Mary Kostakidis, um, MP Andrew Wilkie, uh, a number of Greens MPs who gave excellent speeches and other MPs, and Robbie was able to talk to a number of those people. Um, I'll play a little bit of, well, most actually, this is 95% of Wilkie's speech that I wanted to play. It was an excellent speech, but it also gives some of the background of um, himself as a, one of our first whistleblowers for this country uh, and the fight, the courageous fight he's led to stand up as one of the first MPs and there's more that's gathered around him now in the pro Assange group in the parliament. But he said, as he said at the end of this, he's confident that if we keep the pressure up, we will get justice for Julian. So we'll just roll that clip. Now I first met Julian at the Melbourne Riders Festival in 2004 when I was uh, on a panel speaking about a, a little book I'd written about my own whistleblowing experience over the Iraq war. And after the, uh, the session, this youngish, good looking, blonde haired fellow came up to me. Uh, and I, as best I can remember, that, that's how I describe him, a young, good looking, keen fellow. And he, he picked my brains for a few minutes about how he might set up uh, some sort of safe mechanism for whistleblowers to ventilate uh, and publish the information they have. And we chatted for a little while, and then I forgot all about that. Until I visited Julian in Belmarsh Prison in February 2020, just as the pandemic was starting. And the man I saw in Belmarsh was not the man I had seen at the Melbourne Writers' Festival. By that stage, he'd been in Belmarsh maybe 12 months, virtually all of it in solitary confinement, following, uh, I think, seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy. And he was already a broken, sick man. He did his best to put up a brave face, put on a brave face, but he wasn't entirely successful. I saw someone who clearly was suffering, was the a victim of psychological torture, and was at wit's end. No wonder the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils Melsner, uh, and some of you would be familiar with his recent book, has made it abundantly clear that in his expert opinion, Julian Assange has been subject in Belmarsh Prison to psychological torture. I can, I can only try and imagine what his state is now, and hence the urgency, the absolute urgency for busting him out of Belmarsh as quickly as humanly possible. So I take this opportunity one more time to call on the Australian government to urgently intervene and to fix this. Yes. Now I have a lot of respect for Anthony Albanese and I'm mindful that he said that recently that some things should not be handled with a megaphone. But frankly, we have given this government a fair bit of time now, and there seems to be no uh, no uh, progress on getting him out. Now I know I know Albo has got to manage mixed feelings within the Labor Party and among the left about Julian, but I take this opportunity to say to Anthony again: when you boil it all down, this is all about a Walkley Award-winning Australian journalist who published hard evidence of US war crimes and in response the US wants to get even and so, uh, so long the UK and Australia have been happy to go along for the ride because they've put their bilateral relationships with Washington ahead of the rights of 
a, a decent man, a hero, not a villain, uh, and that is just plain wrong. Please maintain the rage. Keep the pressure on the new government. If we keep the pressure up, then I am confident that eventually justice will prevail for Julian. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, so, yeah, it's really important we keep the pressure up because remember, our Prime Minister, now Prime Minister, before he was Prime Minister in December 2021, said, uh, I've said for some time that enough is enough. He has paid a big price for the publication of that information already and I do not see what purpose is served by the ongoing pursuit of Mr Assange. Um, and then after winning the May 22 election, he said... My position is that not all foreign affairs is best done with the loud hailer. But as we put out in a um, press release on the 26th of July, um, you know, it's not just the absence of a loud hailer. There's been no signs of anything coming from Albanese on this whatsoever. So we need uh, to send him a very clear message. So drop him a line. Uh, we must assert foreign independence by demanding Assange's freedom. If Australia were to stand up for Assange, that would be a clear line in the sand, not just on that issue, but on every foreign policy matter that Australia is not just going to be a pushover for the USA and UK when it comes to much grander designs like plans for world war, for instance. And the reality is Assange did not breach the Espionage Act. He published leaked information for which crime Chelsea Manning was already punished. Um, the real issue is he exposed the lies that led us into permanent wars and the war crimes that were committed during those wars. And Jim. those are the crimes of our dangerous allies. In order to protect the rules-based order. The other aspect, not the economic aspect no, that we talked the about, other but aspect. the other side of it, which is the security and geopolitical framework. So Assange represents the Achilles heel Elisa, for the rules-based order because our the dictates that we're accepting from the UK and the United States you know, it means that we don't have a sovereign, independent in, uh, foreign policy. And you can see what, what Assange has done as a brave Australian doing what he's done, mm. standing up against the UK and the United States. You see the nature, the true nature of what we're dealing with, with these You do, what they're prepared to do to, a, to this one man... And, and it's what also, he's suffered what, through. And we can go through the, you know, what's being done to China and so forth, you know, the attacks on China and the changes that we've talked about on this program towards our attitude towards China over the last five or so years, four or five years. This is all protecting, to protect this rules-based order of free trade, of you know, globalisation. Liberal international order. The liberal <laughs> international order, that's right. You should start calling it that. Yeah. Yes, so that's the show for this week. Uh, don't forget to share, hit the like button, get it out as widely as you can and get on to your MPs. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I'll see you again next week. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.